yeah, I think what I love the most about non-monogamy is it's, yeah, it invites us to get really clear on what we want and what we're available for and then communicate that to other people and, and try to find those like overlapping places where other people can be like, oh yeah, I want that too. Like, let's like build this unique structure that fits both of our needs. Welcome to Normalizing Non-Monogamy, the podcast where we interview incredible people from all over the world to hear their personal journeys of self-discovery through the lenses of love, sex, and relationships. Our mission is to show people that they're not alone and to inspire them to embrace their true selves so that together we can open minds and live authentically without shame. We believe everyone's story is powerful and beautiful, yet it's important to remember that everyone does life a little bit differently and that the views and opinions expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect our own. Additionally, we aren't doctors. Please consult a medical professional for anything regarding your health that you might learn about on the show. Enjoy! Welcome to episode 344. We're Finn and Emma, and today we have a wonderful conversation with Aria. Aria identifies as queer, polyamorous, bisexual, demisexual, and sapiosexual. And today we have an awesome conversation with her, weaving all of these pieces of her identity into her journey. Yes, Aria and her now husband, then boyfriend, opened their partnership up over a decade ago, and she takes us through that journey of all the different iterations and ways that they've explored non-monogamy together and currently landed themselves in a little kitchen table poly dynamic. A beautiful polycule. Yes. And beyond that, Aria has taken many of the skills that she learned through her journeys in non-monogamy and went and got a whole bunch of training and is now a trauma-informed relationship coach and somatic facilitator who does incredible work. And you can check out all of the information about that on her website, which you can find links to in the podcast player show notes down below or on our website normalizing on monogamy click on the podcast tab you will find out all of the information you need there plus pictures of aria and information about all of our previous guests from the last 343 episodes before this yes it's all right there one other quick note about this episode aria talks about her group cohort that she was launching a uh, huge thank you to Aria for her patience. We did this interview a few months ago as we were getting ready to be gone for a little while. And so that cohort has actually just finished. But don't fear, there are more coming in the future. And she has taken a whole bunch of learnings from that and baking them into future ones. So please, again, check out all of Aria's work at ariadiana.com. And you can find, again, links to that in the podcast player show notes. For anyone who is a premium subscriber, we're going to jump right into the interview with this amazing interview, if I should say myself, with, you should say it, <laughs> with Aria right now. And for anyone else, we're going to have a few announcements. First up, if you're not familiar with the premium subscription, it's a way to skip these announcements up front, but don't worry, you still get any important upcoming dates in the outro that we want you to know about. To sign up for the premium subscription, go to our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com, scroll down on the homepage, and you can find links right there. And those dates that Emma's talking about, for example, yes, that would be like maybe if we had a community retreat coming up in September on September 13th to the 15th, 2024. Correct, Emma? Yes, yeah, just, just maybe, hypothetically. Similar to that. So <laughs> if you would like to learn more about this retreat, we're going to actually talk about it for just a hot second. So buckle your seatbelts and sit back and relax. Real quick, before we talk about the in-person retreat, we do want to remind you all that we have an amazing virtual community of about 300 people. You can find out more on the community tab of our website. And we just wanted to make that quick plug. And now more about the in-person retreat. Yes. Yeah, so the in-person retreat is open to anybody who is part of the virtual community. This is our attempt and this is how we're hoping to bridge the gap between all of the virtual connection and support that we've created and the need for in-person gatherings as well. And we've really found that those two go hand in hand and, and support one another and really strengthen each, each one individually. So Again, if you are part of our virtual community, this is open to you. And if you're not yet part of our virtual community, hold tight for just a second. We're going to tell you how you can get a one-month free trial to check it out to see if you want to be part of the community and if you want to come to the retreat. 
The retreat itself will take place September 13th through the 15th in the San Francisco Bay Area, specifically the East Bay. Finn and I have organized tons of activities throughout the weekend, and community members are also starting to organize their own. The weekend will be full of opportunities to connect with each other, create new friendships, and deepen current friendships. We're really excited to bring everyone together. Yes, we are. And if you would like to learn more about this and see a little bit more detail on what that's going to look like, we have posted a amazing, yes, amazing, amazing, beautiful uh, program guide for the weekend. You can find that under the community tab of our website, and there's going to be links directly to that in your podcast show notes down below or on the website, again, under the um, podcast tab, the show notes for this, this specific episode uh, that will take you to the community tab. Now, if you want to join for that free month trial that we were just raving about, go ahead and fill out the application as you normally would to join the community. And in the place where it says, what is your inspiration of joining this community? Say, I want to come to the community retreat in the fall. I'm super excited about it. And I love that free month trial. And when we review your application and let you in, we will hook you up. Yes. So if none of that was clear to you, rewind it, listen again. But the gist of it is on the community tab, there is more information that will give you all of the details of what this retreat is going to look like. So you can kind of look through, see if it sounds like you, and then you can join for a month for free to see if the community feels like you, and then you can sign up. And then we'll see you out here in San Francisco in September. You can also email us with any questions on the contact page of our website. So I'd want to throw that out there as well. Yes. If you were confused, that's a great place to get less confused. (laughs) Next up, we wanted to tell you about something else super exciting that's coming up. Some more dates. Some more dates. Some more of those dates that you'll get in the outro if you're a premium subscriber. This is the Week of Visibility for Non-Monogamy, July 15th to the 19th, 2024. We're super excited about this Week of Visibility and can't wait to share more with you. Yeah, we're going to be running a workshop that week and more details about that will be coming out in the next week or so. But before then, we have this awesome little blurb that got put together by OPEN, which is the Organization for Polyamory and Ethical Non-Monogamy, who are the main organizers behind the Week of Visibility. And we actually love this uh, audio clip because it's got three amazing different podcast hosts, uh, all of who have been on our show. So you're listening to Jolie Hamilton, the whole Multiamory crew, and Carrie from the Relationship Diversity Podcast. So without further ado, they're going to hype it up a little bit. And then we got one last thing to tell you about before we get into this interview with Aria. This is Carrie Jarislow from Relationship Diversity Podcast. This is Dr. Jolie Hamilton from Playing With Fire. This is Emily. This is Dedeker. And this is Jace from the Multiamory Podcast. Join the Global Week of Visibility for Non-Monogamy. July 15th through the 21st. Visit www.weekofvisibility.com to learn more and get involved. Thank you for that. We're really excited again about the Week of Visibility for Non-Monogamy and can't wait to partake as well. More information, again, will be coming very soon. But for now, mark your calendars and you can go to the links in your podcast show notes to find out more about the Week of Visibility. The last thing we wanted to tell you about for real is stdcheck.com. That is our favorite way to get tested for STIs. Emma and I have been using this service for years. We're not going to go on too long about it because we've already talked a long time here. But When you use the links in the podcast show notes or in the resources tab of our website, you save about $10, which brings the cost of a 10-panel test down to $129, and you help support the show financially, which we are super grateful for. And better yet, you get an amazing service, an amazing STI testing service that we cannot highly, more highly recommend. Yes, thank you everyone for using those links and for knowing your sexual health status. And also a final reminder, reach out to us, send us a voicemail, send us an email. We would love to hear from you. All of that information found on the contact page of our website. Thanks for listening to all of these announcements, making it through them. And we're really excited now to jump in with the, to the interview with Aria. Welcome to the podcast, Aria. We're so excited to have you here today. It's a Friday afternoon. It's a beautiful day, and we're here with you and talking, and we can't wait to hear your story. So thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here with you. Yeah, we're excited to dig in and learn a little bit more about you. We we had the privilege of sharing empanadas earlier this week, but nobody else got to be there with us, so <laughs> that's on them. Let's catch them up, though. Who Who is Aria? 
Yeah, thank you. So yeah, I use she, her pronouns. I'm based in the East Bay of San Francisco. I am a trauma-informed relationship coach and somatic facilitator. I work with people practicing non-monogamy to deepen their self-awareness, overcome insecurities, and enhance communication skills so they can really build more liberated relationships that feel expansive and nourishing. Some of the identities I use are bisexual, demisexual, queer, um, sapiosexual is something that I've been identifying with a lot more recently, uh, and polyamorous. Perfect. Well, maybe take us back in time. When did, you know, uh, we'll call it alternative relating. When did relationship styles other than what, what society tells us we should do come into your sort of your life? Yeah. So about a decade ago, I was living in New York City. I think I mentioned on like my second or third date with a man that I was interested in exploring intimate relationships with women. He got very excited and we definitely started exploring more play parties and threesomes, foursomes kind of situations. Um, That was, you know, very new to me. And I think, yeah, over the years, it's really evolved and shifted. I think it was, you know, when I landed in San Francisco that I really, I really understood that there were all of these different ways of relating and creating relationships beyond just in, you know, physical play spaces. So it's been a long journey. I've learned a lot over the years and yeah, my, you know, as a, as I'm stepping into this role as a coach, I really want to help people avoid some of those early mistakes that I made um, Mm -hmm. because yeah, the more more partners you add on, the more complicated it can get. Yes. Exponentially. Definitely. They don't they don't just they're not additive, they're exponential increases, <laughs> I think. But yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and I'm curious, like before that date where you express interest um with you know exploring connections with women, like did you have any experience or role models or anything in your life that was um you know encouraged you to think about relationships a little bit differently? No, definitely not. I So I grew up in a small town in Southern Oregon. My mother was a closeted lesbian for the first 65 years of her life. And so I definitely had a lot of internalized shame and homophobia. And the dominant message I received growing up was, you know, we're looking for a monogamous husband. And um yeah, intimate relating with women was definitely something that felt really scary and something that, um, yeah, I had a lot of shame about. So um, it's been a long journey of really excavating that and realizing that a lot of that was never mine to begin with. And yeah, actually, I I've, was able to clear a lot of that shame through my system through um, a breath work technique. I started studying with um, a breathwork facilitator when I was living in Los Angeles. And in the first class, you know, was laying on the floor breathing and just felt all of this shame arise in my body and realized that it went back to my mom and the stories she was raised with about, you know, what is appropriate and the types of bodies that she is supposed to relate to. So yeah, it's been a really long healing journey for me. And um I actually have my my first girlfriend as of just a few weeks ago, which is like so sweet and something I've really, um, really wanted for a long time. So yeah, it's, it's Yay. interesting to we'll, look we'll, back on like the arc. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll get more into that later, but it's just like, like celebrating that a little bit. Exciting. Yeah, I, and I'm I'm curious then how, like, what if you can think back to this time in New York when you brought this up to this person you're on a date with. Like you have to overcome shame to do that, right? I mean, you're you're swimming in it that I shouldn't want to relate to people. And now you're on a date with a man saying, I'm interested in something that I have. I mean, you probably didn't say it this way, but interested in something that I have a whole lot of shame and conditioning around. What what was it about that one that it was like, this is the time to to say it and throw it out there? Yeah, that's a good question. I think he felt like a safe person. Um, I think from our first couple of dates, we had just really good communication and um, I could tell he was someone that I was going to build a long-term relationship with, and he has since become my husband. And I think at the time I didn't really even realize how much shame I had 
in speaking that aloud until he had shared with some of his friends that like, oh, this woman I went on a date with wants to have a threesome. And I remember just being totally mortified. Like, oh my God, that was so secret. I can't believe you shared that with people. So yeah, I think, it, for, yeah, it's it's been a long journey. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and what was the process as much as you're able or willing to share around I mean, speaking it is one thing, but but bringing it into reality is another. And I I think you know one of the maybe things that we have seen is that idea of uh, again typically we're going into the binary here, but typically a woman telling her male partner that she's interested in threesomes with other women that usually raises a lot of like uh, good alarm bells in people. They're like, ooh, exciting! I get to th- threesome, 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 threesome. But obviously, there's a lot more to it. And I'm curious, how did you two go from the conception of that to making it a reality that you were going to start trying to do? And again, you're fighting a lot of shame through this process. Yeah, yeah, it was, I think at the time, yeah, he was very excited by this conversation. (laughs) And was kind of like, well, who, you know, is there anyone you're thinking about? Do you know anyone who you think is cute? And I was kind of like, yeah, there's this one girl who I've been kind of crushing on secretly. Um, And so we made our intentions known to her. And after pursuing her for a long time and definitely drinking way too much alcohol together, um, she eventually came home with us. And it was interesting to look back on kind of like learn from that experience of like, okay, how does consent change with alcohol and substances and we were all pretty inebriated and i think yeah because we we all had a lot of shame around that experience it was like what was necessary to to feel safe enough to go there and unfortunately she never spoke to us again after that experience she was a you know raised catholic and had her own shame around that so um yeah i think it just speaks to like how much deprogramming and internalized homophobia there is really pervasive totally. in our culture yeah mm-hmm. yeah well, i'm sorry that's how it, it it worked out in the end for that and and to for sharing that you're right i think the 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 journey of we don't know what we're doing we have a lot of shame but if we get drunk or high or under the influence of something we can push through that and we'll we'll be okay on the other end and perhaps we are okay but that doesn't mean that the impact isn't real on the relationships and some you know we carry that forward regardless. So, yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, it sounds like you didn't hang up your non-monogamy slippers at that point. you you continued on after that. How did, how did it evolve from there? Yeah, I think, you know, that was the first big experience. It took us some time to integrate that um first you know threesome and we kind of started explore more sex positive communities in new york went to some play parties um those were positive experiences but we yeah the the timing of it's interesting we had also recently sat in an ayahuasca ceremony which really gave us a lot of um information about how we were living and it really was a catalyst to make some major changes. So we left New York City pretty soon after that. I think it was, yeah, a period of a lot of personal growth and looking at like, how do we want to live? And are we in alignment with what we want to be doing with our lives? At the time, I was working as a copywriter, doing really terrible schlocky work for things that I didn't believe in. And yeah, having this really uh, expansive medicine ceremony made me realize like, oh, like I want to be writing different things. Like this is not how I want to use my creative energy. So yeah, ended up leaving New York and and that partner and I spent a year driving around the country trying to figure out, like make sense of all of this new information. We definitely ended up at a play party in Denver, which was not a positive experience. It was like at some ranch outside of the city and they had like a steak and lobster dinner. And I remember we didn't go to the, for the dinner, but we came in afterwards and the whole place smelled like seafood and was just like not sexy. It's like all of these people who kind of looked like my father in like their rancher clothes. Um, so that was not not the scene for us. But we learned a lot by, you know, being in this other community and 
uh, got more information about like, okay, maybe that's not for us. Um, let's keep exploring. And we ended up landing in Los Angeles and um, spent about a year there before moving up to the Bay Area. So yeah, it's um, it's been really sweet to land in the Bay Area, where which really feels like the epicenter of LGBTQ culture and um, have made a lot of wonderful queer friends. And yeah, it's, it's been fascinating to really develop a community that primarily is non-monogamous. I feel like we're in such a bubble here now where, you know, I'll go home to Oregon or I'll travel to other parts of the world and share openly about, you know, my life and how I relate to others. And it feels really normal and natural now. And it's, it's funny to, yeah, remember that for a lot of other people, this feels like really edgy or, uh, yeah, it can be challenging for other people. Mm -hmm, mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Like it's it, the Bay Area is kind of its own uh, uh, separate it's a bubble. place. Yeah, it is a bubble. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's easy place. to forget that. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And I'm curious, like since you touched on uh, right now, like what does your relationship structure look like? What what? Yeah, what are you practicing right now? Yeah, so we've landed in a really sweet kitchen table poly structure. I live with my husband, nesting partner. I have a girlfriend who I see a couple times a week. I have another lover who lives in a different town in California who I see maybe once a month. And actually just this last week, my partner's partner and her partner were here for dinner. So yeah, it feels like a really sweet um, little supportive polycule that we have built. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's amazing, and and I will just maybe notice a a large or a far a far cry from getting drunk and having a threesome that ends with nobody talking to each other again. <laughs> so there's like there's a lot of ground that you've covered in a in a decade to get there, and yeah, I would I would love to you know again at whatever level you're comfortable talking about what you know some of that journey looked like for you because I mean we know some people right who start right where you're at they're like hey right out of the gate day one is kitchen table poly and everybody's good with that but that is that was not our situation or our trajectory and it sounds like it wasn't yours and so I'm I'm curious you know coming off of your road trip coming off of the failed uh, surf and turf play party like what <laughs> where did that take you <laughs> take you <laughs> yeah. I'm, just, I'm just picturing lobster in the middle of like a ranch in the desert of Colorado. And I'm like, not the native environment for most lobsters. So yeah, I can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did was not, not the sexiest environment for me. Um, yeah, I think it's been a real journey of personal work and a lot of therapy. Um, you know, I had my own therapist for a long time. My partner has a therapist. We had a couple therapists. So, you know, I think, yeah, I think I see non-monogamy really as an invitation to deepen self-awareness and learn more about our triggers and what we actually desire. And it's, for me, it's really been a practice of like getting clear on what I want and being able to communicate that and own it and advocate for it and have boundaries and learn how to hold them. And yeah, it is funny to think back about, you know, those early experiences and where we are now. And yeah, I, you know, have had some really challenging experiences with non-monogamy. I, you know, was dating a couple about five years ago and went through a really traumatic breakup with them right as the pandemic hit, like big T trauma, um, which sent me on a really deep healing journey that I wouldn't actively opt in for. But um, yeah, there's been a lot of really incredible post-traumatic growth that came out of that. It really shifted my trajectory in a lot of ways. So yeah, for me, non-monogamy has been a really great healing tool in a lot of ways. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. And did in that time, right, maybe leading up to that, where you're dating couples or dating, like I think the the jump from we're going to play parties or we're just kind of, you know, having casual fun too. We're, we're starting to date. We're starting to have deeper connections or relationships. 
did you find in that that you that was sort of an ease like it, it felt a bit of at ease for you that that was sort of where you belonged or did you find yourself struggling with either balancing your feelings with for other people or watching your partner maybe fall in love or or go beyond just the like play party you know physical interaction yeah I think it was a steep learning curve, to be honest, you know, going from, you know, this is something we're primarily doing together with, you know, just for fun and to, yeah, to really be like, okay, how do we hold multiple loving relationships simultaneously? I think some of those early, you know, more romantic emotional connections um, we're really, you know, the blind leading the blind. None of us had ever really done that before. We didn't have the skills or the tools. I think I learned a lot the hard way about the importance of proactive communication. I, yeah, as somebody who was dating a couple, I didn't really advocate for my needs or didn't realize that I should, you know, be a vocal part in creating the agreements that the three of us had. It was very much like me dating a couple in the early days and them deciding how it was going to be structured and not necessarily communicating a lot of what they were talking about or struggling with. And that is definitely a situation I, I wouldn't repeat. And I always like to warn people, like if, you know, it, it can be fun to join an established couple, but also as the third person coming into that, it's really important to, to remember that you get to, advocate for your needs and you should be allowed to, you know, develop one-on-one connections with both people instead of, you know, having to date the couple, which was my experience. And, um, yeah, it was, that was, it was a challenging experience and yeah. What, yeah. What is like the, for you today, like looking back, like the proactive communication style or skills that you bring forth today, what does that look like? Because I, yeah. I, it's super powerful, and I'm curious what it actually for you like looks like, or maybe how you would have yeah, used like, it back then if you yeah. could go back in time with your skills today to fight that fire. Yeah, that's a great question. I think I think I was just making a lot of assumptions at the time, like, okay, you guys are going to tell me what you're available for and how we're going to do this. And I think now, yeah, I would have made. Um, more of an effort to have intentional check-ins regularly about, you know, what we're doing. And as the feelings deepen, like, how is everyone feeling? What are we needing? Like, where are your boundaries? Here are my boundaries. Yeah. And just creating more intention around it. I um, recently discovered the multi-amory podcast and they have a lot of great communication tools. I recently kind of adapted their Triforce of Communication framework. Um, I found that it was hard for me to remember what those three things were. And my memory definitely benefits from alliteration. So I've created um, like an original framework that I'm calling the triple A timeout, which is essentially the Triforce, but this is just an easier way for me to remember it. So those three things are awareness, assurance, or advice. So it's essentially, yeah, when you're having a conversation with a partner and you're feeling unsatisfied or you're not sure, um, you know, or you want clarity on how they want you to engage. So it can feel good for both of you. Yeah. It's like, do you want me, are you just wanting to share with me and fill me in about something that happened? That's the awareness. Do you need words of affirmation and support that it's going to be okay? Or are you looking for me to help you find solutions and potential action items? So, you know, that is something that has been really helpful for me is just like having more clarity around how to communicate. Um, My partner and I also have a kind of like daily check-in framework that we use called TEAM. And essentially uh, T stands for touch. So we'll like hold hands usually after dinner when we're resourced and fed. And so it's just kind of a way to like build intimacy and create um, like a low stakes emotional check-in. So yeah, we'll touch, hold hands. E is for educate. So we'll share one thing that we learned during the day. A is for appreciation. So we offer some words of gratitude for each other. And um, in this framework, the M used to stand for metric, but we found that kind of confusing. So we changed it to memo. 
So if, you know, the other person has done, done something annoying during the day, it'll be like, I'm going to save that for a memo later and like let my nervous system calm down. Um, so, you know, that has been another great check-in process um, just to create, yeah, more of a ritual around communicating, checking in, in a way that it's, you're not like building up all of this resentment and haven't had a chance to talk about things that are bothering you. And I find that's a great way to kind of let some of the pressure off in terms mm -hmm. of potential issues and catching them before they spiral into something bigger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I love the, like the proactive tools that you just went through too. Like those are things that we can all, if they resonate with anybody listening, can actually try to do. Yeah. Yeah. And really quick, just for anybody who's not familiar with the Triforce of communication, I think is it's one of those sort of like a meta conversation about the conversation. And so what I, I love your alliteration because it actually t it, it, it lands better for me. Um, but mm -hmm. like the Triforce for anybody who wants to go and look this up, Maltamory is a great resource for it. But there's basically T1, T2, T3, and there are various levels of like I'm coming to Emma with something. What maybe I had a hard day, something's bothering me, and I go, "Hey Emma, I need to share something with you." This is a T1, or for you, it would be the the uh, the first A, which was awareness. Awareness, right? So I just want to tell this thing to you. I don't want you to give me any feedback. I don't even want you to. I just want you to hear it, right? Versus the second one is, yeah, I would love your assurance, feedback, just something to. Yeah, make me almost make me feel good, right? Some something to build me up versus let's say the T3, which is I'm looking for some help here. I'm truly lost. I, I need some advice, right? And this helps us. This helped us a lot because I'm a fixer. So pretty much anything she would bring me, I'm like, oh, that's a thing I can fix. And most of the time, almost all of the time, it's <laughs> not. And it's not even something that I should be trying to fix. And so I would spend a lot of time getting caught fixing things that weren't mine to fix. So it's a great tool to really come into a conversation clear of what, what's the point of the conversation. So yeah, just yeah, thought so I'd that reiterate that. that. Yeah, yeah. For anybody who's not super familiar with it, cause it's, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a nuanced technique and I think it's a really powerful one. So I'm glad mm -hmm. you touched on it and have adapted it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the other thing that I think is super important to like, remember with all these communication tools is, um, yeah, like learning to pay more attention to your nervous system and like what state you're in. It's like no matter how many great communication tools you have, if your nervous system is in a state of activation or shutdown, like you're not going to remember these tools and you're going to be totally flooded and be in a, you know, defensive, reactive. That not a good time to have that conversation. Not a great time to communicate. No, I always tell people like, take 20 minutes, wait until these stress hormones have left your body, go walk around the block, try not to think about the conflict and come back to each other when you're, you know, more physiologically regulated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Super yeah. easy to do yeah. when you're in the middle of a, of, a, of a fight of some kind, like, okay, I'm just going to go for a walk and calm down. Not how we do it typically, but yeah. Super smart if we can. Yeah. Well, and I think it's the, the Gottmans talk about how, um, that break, you know, the break is super powerful and it can be 20 minutes, but usually try not to make it longer than 24 hours because then you want to revisit things as well. But to give yourself some time in that space, enough time to have your uh, nervous system come back a little bit to, to regulate it. Definitely. Yeah. So important. I love that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. I'm curious too, like, just on this journey that you've been on the last many years, um, are there other things that stand out to you as places of growth? Yeah. Yeah. I think I've definitely done a lot of intentional work around shifting my mindset about, you know, what is appropriate, what a relationship is supposed to look like. Uh, and it's really been an invitation to get more creative and look at, you know, how do I want to live? How do I want to structure my life and my friendships and my community? I think so many people, yeah, just default to monogamy without making a conscious choice about it. And I think by going on this journey, it's really given me a lot of spaciousness to try things on and figure out, you know, what, what I personally want from my connections and, and yeah, really unlearning some of those toxic monogamy 
frameworks. I think, you know, I actually um, recently started a new st- sub stack and I'm publishing long form essays every Tuesday and had a lot of fun recently with one kind of looking at the mainstream coverage of non-monogamy. It's definitely trending, but from what I am seeing, it's like a lot of um, the writing is just perpetuating toxic monogamy uh, with the assumption that it's just that, but with more people. And so, you know, I see toxic monogamy as, you know, this, the way our culture celebrates enmeshment and codependency and encourages people to be possessive and jealous of other people's time and energy. And I think that is definitely an important part of like the mind sh- mindset shift to do non-monogamy well is like moving away from these ideas of control and feeling like you are entitled to your partner's time and energy and really remembering that like to be in relationship is a choice and we get to decide how we want to relate to each other and when, and instead of just assuming that we're going to do everything together. So yeah, I think it's for sure. It's been a lot of mindset work, communication work and nervous system regulation work. And, and those are kind of like the three main areas that I've uh, built this new uh, group coaching program around is, you know, I noticed everybody who I was talking to was struggling with these three issues and was like, oh yeah, these are all the things that I've struggled with too. So let me build out this curriculum that really supports people and um, strengthening these tools and practices. Yeah, it's amazing. And you've, cause you've cr- sort of lived on both sides of this coin. You've lived on that. I was in a relationship with a couple where it sounds like they were bringing a lot of, again, it, not not to vilify monogamy, right? Like if monogamy is your thing and it works for you and you're happy with it, no no problem, right? But if if you're sort of the toxic pieces you brought in there around the control and, and everything, but you were sort of living in that world of dating or in a relationship with a couple where it sounds like they were still very much almost a monogamous couple where you were like an add-on in some ways. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm curious how you took your sort of learnings and experience there forward into now where like you have a girlfriend and you're you have a nesting partner who you're married to not that you're dating her together but i think it would be easy for a lot of those the hierarchy and the like our nesting partnership takes precedent and i'm just curious how you've sort of woven in your learnings from being on the other side into being on this side of it. Yeah. It's a long question to get there, but th- <laughs> yeah. thanks for going on the ride with me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll start um, a piece of it and maybe you can ask me another question if I, if I don't quite answer what you are getting at, but um, yeah, I think, you know, I recognize that there is some inherent hierarchy with my nesting partner. We share finances, we live together, we share a single car, which, yeah, I think, you know, I've heard people say non-monogamous people just have a scheduling kink and, as a former producer of, you know, film and events, I definitely like my spreadsheets and I'm a very type A organized person and yeah, and love to schedule things with all of my partners. And, but yeah, we've gotten to a place where, yeah, despite that kind of built in hierarchy, that there is a lot of freedom to connect with people and, um, build out, um, partnerships and queer friendships that, um, meet, our needs in different ways. And yeah, I definitely brought a lot of, you know, my learnings on how, on the mistakes I've made and the tough lessons into my coaching business. And, you know, through that really traumatic experience that I went through, went back to school to study more about trauma and somatics. And, and so it's, um, yeah, I definitely have done my best to kind of package my learnings and lessons in a way that other people can get inside and hopefully avoid making some of the same sticky mistakes. And yeah, the hope is to help people prevent creating harm to themselves and others as they go on this journey of, yeah, deep unlearning. Yeah. Yeah. It is a deep unlearning. (laughs) Yeah. And it sounds like, you know, a lot of that, um, I keep wanting to say like preventative maintenance, the proactive conversations that you were craving in that partnership where you were saying like, I just assumed they were going to bring this to the table and bring that and share this and share that. And yet you didn't get that. And it sounds like you've figured out 
a lot of these tools, the Triforce, the AAA, they're your ways of doing it that now you can bring those and model those for anybody that comes into your partnership. So you're not necessarily putting your nesting partnership so high on a pedestal that everybody else is just swimming in the wake of your sort of destruction around it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, important to try to communicate to other partners coming in, like, you know, here's my structure, here are the existing things I have in place and build, yeah, build relationships based on mutual interests and mutual availability. And yeah, it requires so much communication. And yep. <laughs> yeah, which is, yeah, that was going to be my point too, is like, there is inherent hierarchy like that in certain relationships. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It's how it's communicated and the expectations that are set around it. And that's what I feel like you're getting to is like, there's so much communication because there needs to be and that to be, and that was what was missing in the past. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great way to say it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, kind of like, what has your journey been uh, being open with others, friends, family about your journey in monogamy? Yeah. So I came out to my mom about six years ago. And it was interesting to remember the way she had come out to me and my brothers back when I was in college. And it's been a really sweet, really connective journey of sharing more with her. I would say she's a family member who I've shared the most with because I know she has her own long journey of coming out very late in life as well. And yeah, every time I go home, I try to make a point to take her out for a walk or have coffee and ask her more questions about her own journey of opening up. And, you know, I learned in those conversations that when she was a young girl, the only person she ever knew who was a lesbian or um, anything other than strictly heterosexual was her cousin, Ruthie, who had moved to San Francisco and the family completely disowned her. So the message that my mom received was we don't talk about Ruthie. So um, yeah, I think it's been a really healing journey for her as well to be able to share some of these things with me that she's definitely kept bottled up for 70 years and try to create a safe space for her to, you know, open up a little bit about that. So, um, yeah, it's been, it's been a cool journey of connecting with her about, um, yeah, both of our desires to be with women. And mm -hmm. I did share with my father who is a Republican Trump supporter in Montana, and he did not want to hear too much more about that. And so respected those boundaries. We no longer talk about my relationship in that way. And I actually recently had, um, a funny conversation with one of my brothers because as I'm sharing more on Instagram about my own journey and these coaching offerings, I realized that I was sharing a lot of information that I hadn't necessarily directly told him. Uh, and he follows me on Instagram. So we had a really cute chat the other day and I said, you know, I I'm realizing that I'm sharing a lot of information that you haven't heard from me directly. And if, if you have questions or you want to talk more about this, like I'm open to that. And also if you want to unfollow me, like that's okay too. <laughs> Um, and he was like, yeah, I've seen you posting about that and it's not for me, but if you're helping other people, I guess that's cool. So it's like this, like I'm, I'm supportive and also don't necessarily need to hear too much about that, which totally respect that. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So a little bit of a mixed bag, like mixed experiences, but I love, I do love that it's brought you and your mom closer. Like the fact that there's a thread there of her life and your life that you can really connect with is really sweet. Yeah. Yeah. It's been really sweet to get to know her in ways that I think a lot of people haven't ever known her and she hasn't, you know, been seen in that way. So yeah. it's definitely been a really sweet, sweet journey for us together. Yeah. And, and almost a, an opportunity for her to, I mean, not do to you what happened to Ruthie and for you to not do to her, right? You're both sort of unlearning so much conditioning that like this thing about both of us that, that we sort of share an attraction to our same gender is now something that binds us instead of something that has to like divide us. I think mm -hmm. that's just really powerful to be able to have. Yeah, I feel like it's so important to create safe spaces for people to share about 
the parts of themselves that they keep in the shadows and maybe don't even consciously, yeah, aren't aware of themselves or have never explored. And um, yeah, it's been really sweet to do that with her. And that's definitely, you know, my intention with creating coaching spaces and group events. Um, yeah, just to really normalize this conversation and give people, yeah, a space to be seen and practice, yeah, taking up space in ways that maybe they've never done before. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I'm I, I'm curious about something that I'm not sure exactly how to ask the question, so I'll, I'll do my darndest. Is <laughs> sort of over the let's say the last decade, you you've come out to a boyfriend now husband about being bisexual or being interested in women. You started down the path of like exploring sexually with that, and you've landed just in the last few weeks of actually finding yourself in a partnership, in a relationship with a woman. And you said like that was something you'd been looking for for a, a while. And I'm just curious what what that's felt like to finally, ar- I want to say like arrive, not that that was your end goal or that that is the end all be all, but, but 10 years later. Yeah, but that's a 10 year journey, probably more than that, probably a multi-decade journey of understanding who you are, figuring out who you are, figuring out how to accept who you are. And now you've got it just a few weeks ago, right? I'm curious what that's been like for you. Yeah, I'm finding myself with a big grin on my face, which people can't see. But (laughs) yeah, I mean, I've definitely had, you know, I've dated women in the past, but it's always been pretty casual. And but yeah, in this moment, like having another committed partnership with a woman feels so sweet. And yeah, every... Every new year, I do this exercise called the year compass. And essentially, it's this really sweet journaling exercise where you look at the year that has just closed and you set intentions for the year to come. And I think it was December of 2022, I was working on this exercise. And the last page of the booklet has a section called like my secret wish for the year. And I remember in December 2022, writing out my wish to find finally find my poly girlfriend and being very clear about who she was and our shared values around social justice and personal growth. Um, I really wanted to find somebody who liked to cook. For me, that's one of my greatest pleasures. And it's not something that my nesting partner necessarily enjoys doing with me. Um, and so I was like, okay, I'm going to find another person who loves food, who wants to spend time in the kitchen with me and and wrote all these very specific things about this person. And yeah, it it was really sweet to meet this person who was like, oh, I think, I think maybe this is the person that I've been looking for. And yeah, just to keep finding more shared things in common. And um, yeah, I, I, it feels like satisfying on like a soul level to yeah, finally find a person who, yeah, on in some way I've been looking for for a long time and, you know, only very, you know, in the last couple of years got very clear about like how I wanted that to look. And um, yeah, I think it's so helpful to really get clear on what we're desiring. And, you know, you see a lot of like woo woo stuff out there about like manifestation, but I really think it's true. Like if you know, what you're looking for and what you're not available for. And it's so much easier to find it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I love that story too. And I, I'm also curious, like how did you two meet if you're open to sharing? We met on field <laughs> where I've met a lot of my queer non-monogamous mm-hmm. community. So yeah, we connected last October and it's been a really sweet sweet slow process of getting to know each other and being yeah like, yeah I think you're my poly girlfriend this is cute <laughs> <laughs> yeah and like 10 months earlier had written these things and like just I love that you've been patient with the process too like patient with figuring out where what you're wanting and and what you're wanting today and how that could change in the future who knows but like you're getting clear on more and more clear over the years on like things that you are wanting and then going out to find them and finding them. It's yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a cool process of being like, okay, what do I actually want and how do I make that happen for myself? Yeah. 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 
And I think being able to, it sounds like communicate it, right? I know we just keep coming back to that and saying, <laughs> right? Like you, you kind of threw it out there as manifesting and I, who am I to argue that? It's just, I think what I've seen in my own world is the earlier I communicate to people what I'm interested in, the faster like the sorting happens. Mm-hmm. And I know this sounds very engineering because yes, I'm an engineer, but it's to me, it's like, well, if we don't like we could meet and in 10 minutes be able to say, I'm interested in this and you're interested in something completely the opposite. That's not to say that we shouldn't ever talk again, but let's not go down the wrong path together, right? We we could go down a different path that is better suited for us and not waste a lot of time and energy and resources building something that's not a good fit for us. So let's build what is a good fit for us. And being able to do that earlier and earlier as you get more and more comfortable with who you are and what you want and I think a lot of that comes from trying it, getting it wrong, doing it different the next time. Yeah. Yeah. I think what I love the most about non-monogamy is it's, yeah, it invites us to get really clear on what we want and what we're available for and then communicate that to other people and and try to find those like overlapping places where other people can be like, oh yeah, I want that too. Like, let's like build this unique structure that fits both of our needs. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I love that too. Yeah, I think I think in there to the around the like we try, we we learn something new, we make mistakes, we learn again, we uh, right. And so I'm curious if there are things that have come up in the last ten years that you're that maybe what's going to go in that secret wish for next year? Maybe is the the short and the short way to ask that question, right? A couple of years ago, it was finding the poly girlfriend. I'm curious if as you've been doing this, something else has sort of risen to the top of like. What what am I looking for sort of coming up next? Yeah. You know, I think for me, I'm at this place with my relationships where I feel like polysaturated, really satisfied. Like, you know, I know relationships and seasons are always changing. Um, so I think for me, the things that I'm more dreaming about are more for the wider community. I definitely have a not so secret wish to host retreats with my poly non-monogamous community. I have been working on a memoir also for a long time. I started that at the beginning of our road trip back in 2014. So also a decade ago. And it's a project that I have worked on over the years and returned to. I took a month long writer's sabbatical retreat in December of 2022, where I was in the mountains in a cabin by myself and um, had feedback from three different readers of that manuscript and spent the month creating a new draft of that. And I realized I didn't work on that project at all in 2023, but it's something I very much want to return to in the near future. I had a mentor who I'd been wanting to share that project with for a long time, give me incredible feedback. And he asked me, tell me in one word, what this book is about. And I really struggled to do that. I said, can I give you two sentences? It's about healing shame and integrating my all of the parts of myself. And it's about my healing journey and non-monogamy. And, and he was like, no, it has to be tighter than that. Give me one word. So I've been sitting on that. And so, yeah, I think my, my secret wish would be to create, you know, space for me to go on another retreat and, um, yeah, really spend more time with that project. It's definitely been, you know, a labor of love and a passion project that kind of ebbs and flows. And at some point we'll be ready to share with the world. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm getting a lot of energy and excitement from all of my different creative projects. So yeah, events and writing are definitely things that I'm, I want to create more space for. Perfect. Well, maybe that's a great segue into maybe talking a little bit more about your work because I think that fits perfectly right here. And so what you've you've touched on it a few times, uh, your new program you're running, some of the education you've done. Could you maybe dig in a little bit more on what what your work looks like, what people could expect if they work with you and what the program is that you've uh, just just launched? Yeah, definitely. So I just launched a group coaching program called Nourishing Non-Monogamy, and it's really designed for 
yeah, people who are beginning to open their relationship or are struggling with insecurity or communication breakdowns or having trouble regulating their nervous system and want to practice in a group in an intentional way. So I think by the time this podcast drops, that group will have just started. We begin on the spring equinox and we'll meet, yeah, every week for 12 weeks. And it's a mix of a lot of different healing modalities that I've accumulated over the years. In the past, I had a weekly breathwork group at some meditation studios in San Francisco pre-pandemic. So I'm excited to bring that modality back. It was definitely a really um, important way for me to work through some of the limiting mindsets that I carried in my body that I didn't even know were there. We'll have a lot of communication exercises and space for people to practice these new ways of communicating their needs and identifying boundaries. Um, We're also going to do something called a story exchange, which is a modality that Narrative 4 developed. It's an organization that is used everywhere from schools to boardrooms to really build empathy and deep listening skills and help people realize that they're not alone in their experience. Um, there's also a layer of peer support. So everyone in the program will get mashed up with one other student who's at a similar place in their journey. So I'm really excited to, yeah, create this new space and, and we'll definitely offer it again, probably in August of 2024 is what I'm thinking. Um, so yeah, it's a mix of somatic tools, mindset tools. It's really a mind body approach to, transforming how we show up in relationship and give people new tools um, yeah, to find more nourishment in their non-monogamy explorations. Beautiful. Yes. I love it. I love it. And I'm excited for this to continue in the future too, of like using this one to really see how it goes and to you've, developed a beautiful curriculum and excited to see, yeah, how, how you tweak that and refine it and continue moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, just so people know links to all of your work will be in the show notes so they don't have to try to Google around and find you. Uh, There will be links to everything there so people can learn more about you and your work. Thank you for everything you've shared. And we've loved hearing more about your journey and just the, incredible experiences you have have had and what you are currently building too to like share that with others out there um, as you continue continue to learn and grow um, is there anything else that you feel like you would want to get out there uh, while you're while we're talking today yeah I mean I, I would love to share that I'm also doing one-on-one somatic coaching mm-hmm. and that's been really sweet. Um, you know, so until this next group cohort launches, I definitely am really getting a lot of joy from supporting people in a one-on-one capacity and yeah, really helping people look at their own mindsets, notice where they need more support around expanding their window of tolerance when it comes to their nervous system, helping them identify resources that can help return them to, you know, um, a grounded state and, yeah, practicing communicating. So, um, yeah, I have space for a couple more one-on-one clients for the next couple months. And so if anybody is struggling with any of those things, or they also have a history of struggling with their bisexuality, they're definitely, yeah, those are the clients that I'm really enjoying working with the most. Yeah. Amazing. Well, I can say for myself, it wasn't until recently that I learned I had a nervous system that that was reacting all the time. And I didn't know that's what it was. I just thought everybody's chest felt like it was on fire all the time. And that was what we were supposed to feel. So that was a fun experiment to, or a fun thing to discover in the last few years. So yeah, if you're out there going, oh, that's not normal. Well, it, maybe it is normal, but you might want to think about unpacking it a little. Learning a little bit more. Learning a little more about why your chest feels like it's on fire. <laughs> yeah, I was going to, yeah, go for it. <laughs> Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, I, I feel like there's such a need for more information about how our nervous systems work. And I think I was saying this to you guys when we had empanadas earlier this week is like, why didn't we learn all of this in elementary school as like a foundational emotional intelligence uh, curriculum, you know, how, how our bodies work, how we're always responding to internal and external cues. And they send us down these different paths of, you know, seeking connection or protection. And um, yeah, for me, it was really a game changer to learn a lot more about polyvagal theory and 
yeah, helping people learn how to map their nervous systems and recognize their common trigger patterns. And um, yeah, is it such a such a game changer for me and for other people. So yeah, it's definitely a great thing that I, I wish we all knew more about. Yeah. Yeah. And my question was going to be like, what I was going to ask you, like, what does somatic coaching look like for you? But I feel like you just answered that in the last <laughs> little bit. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to just like quickly add that. Yeah. I, I see it as like a three part um, process of really mm-hmm. looking at like what is embodied in us that doesn't align with our values and how can we bring awareness to those patterns and find ways to open them and shift them. Um, and it's really about, yeah, getting new tools to practice that help us respond to situations in more embodied ways and having more choice when presented with a, a challenging situation. It's so easy to fall back on our you know, internalized default patterns. And for me, a lot of that used to be like, I would get triggered by a conversation with a partner and I would shut down and slam doors and like flee the scene. And now with more tools and practice, I can learn to recognize like, hey, I'm feeling overwhelmed and flooded. Can we slow down? Like, I need to like sit and breathe for a minute. Let me go for a walk and then I'm going to come back and then we can continue this conversation. Um, So yeah, it's helpful just to look at kind of like the common protective or defensive shapes that we make when we feel threatened and practice showing up in different ways that align with how we want to be in relation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for that addition as well. Yeah. And yeah. and thank you for everything you've shared with us today, for sharing a bit about your story and your work and taking us on the journey. So thank you, Aria, for being here and for doing the work you do. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me and so appreciate this podcast and the resources you're creating to help normalize non-monogamy. It's really beautiful. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Yeah. 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 And until next time, have a wonderful sunny Friday afternoon. Enjoy the sun in the bay because it's fleeting sometimes. And so with that, we'll, uh, we'll talk to you soon. Okay. Thanks guys. Enjoy your afternoon. And we're back. Thank you so much, Aria, for everything you shared today and for the amazing work that you do. A quick reminder, go to the links in the podcast show notes to check out Aria's work. Join one of her upcoming group cohorts again that she'll be doing and just all around badass. Support her work, please. Yes. Thank you, Aria, for all you do. And we're excited to continue to get to know you better as you just live down the road here out in the Bay Area. And that's amazing. A few quick date reminders coming up in July. July 15th to the 19th is the Week of Visibility for Non-Monogamy. We will be participating in that as well, running a workshop likely on the 17th of July. But more information, again, using the links in the podcast show notes, find out more. And the other... Oh, oh, oh. We do not have the official information for our workshop yet, hoping to have that by the end of this week. So you can count on that by next week. And you can find out more about the Week of Visibility at weekofvisibility.com. Yes. All right. Which is also linked in the show notes. Yes, ma'am. And the other reminder is our community retreat will be September 13th to the 15th in the San Francisco Bay Area. If you'd like to find out more, go to the community page of our website and you can find out more there. Uh, We're really excited about this and can't wait to bring many of you together. And next week, you're not going to believe this. We've got an interview. It's an amazing interview with community members, actually, which is super fun. And people who've been at many of our virtual meet and greets in the past, Taylor and Curran. It's a fun one. Yes. It's it's a wild one. It's one of those that people are going to probably listen and go, that ain't fucking real. And I'm telling you, (laughs) it's it's fucking real. So we will see you in a week. Until then, have a wonderful weekend and uh, stay safe out there. Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening.